yet. So here's a shout out to the more than 57,000 drivers who admittedly made it easy for the thieves last year. 57,000 who left the keys in their vehicle and had it stolen. A 22% increase in just a year. Old habits die hard and thieves can't help themselves, especially when it's so easy. So why is it so difficult for some people to turn off the car, take the key or the fob, and lock it up before they walk away. Turn off the ignition and lock your vehicle every time you get out. Don't leave keys or fobs inside. Put all valuables out of sight in the truck or take them with you. Lock it before you leave it. Don't make it easy for the thief. If you know something about vehicle theft or insurance fraud, call us at 1-800-TELL-NICB. That's 1-800-TEL-NICB. A public service message from the National Insurance Crime Bureau. Today, Today we, we decided decide to, to walk, walk to school. At the corner, we, we waited to cross the street. The stoplight counted down. down. 15, 14, 41, 31, I mean 13. We, we took, took a, a left, left on Carroll Garden Street. Garden Street? Loud, Loud music, music was coming from, from a car. car. Danny's a smart kid, but he gets so distracted. There were so many other sounds. I didn't know what to focus on. Danny, Earth to Danny. Suddenly, he realized he forgot his homework again. I left my homework on the table. At the, the school, school steps, we hugged goodbye. goodbye. I, I really, really hope he doesn't have another, another bad day at school, school today. today. When you can see learning and attention issues from their side, you can be on their side. That's why there's understood.org, a free online resource for the parents of the one in five kids with learning and attention issues. Get personalized recommendations, practical tips, daily access to experts, and more. Go from misunderstanding to understood.org. Brought to you by Understood in the Ad Council. Welcome to the new John Simmons Show. After years of battling a gambling addiction, John found hope and a future for his life through Christ. He has spent the last several years encouraging others to find joy, peace, and hope in their lives by walking out God's plan for their lives. Now, John wants to help you find the passion vision and faith you need to start writing out God's sentence for your life and help you add to it every day. Four lines are now open. Call or text 314-880-0808. Now, here is your host, the new John Simmons. Hey, everybody, welcome. It's the new John Simmons Show, part of the Testimony House Network, where you can find God's sentence for your life and become the new you, where we talk about finding passion, vision, and faith in your walk with Christ so that your life can overflow with joy, peace, and hope today. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm very excited. We have a brand new guest uh, to start off tonight's show. Her name is Dr. Susan Lynn. She is the author of The Case for Make Believe, Saving Play in a Commercialized World. She's also a research associate at Boston Children's Hospital and a psych- lecturer on psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. I most recently found her on the documentary Mr. Rogers and Me. She has extensively written on the effects of media and commercial marketing on children. I have a lot of questions for her, and so let's bring her to the phone lines. Dr. Susan Lynn, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, John. How are you? I'm so blessed to have you on the show. I'm doing fine, by the way. Uh, To give you a little background, we talk a lot about how we can improve programming in the world today and not just uh, add to the pile of nonsense that's out there. And I know that your heart is very much in, you know, protecting our children and educating our children. So if you don't mind, give our audience a little background about who you are and what your field is. Okay, so um, I uh, began life as a ventriloquist, (laughs) and um, I uh, did performances um, all over the country, and I worked with Fred Rogers um, periodically for um, quite a long time. And I became a psychologist, and then I founded an organization called Campaign for Commercial Free Childhood, Yes, which takes on corporate America for the way ways that they harm children through targeting them with advertising and marketing. That's incredible. I want to dive into a lot of what you just got into, just a few sentences. You've already unpacked so much. So let's start with the 
ventriloquism, uh, not an often associate. You don't hear a lot of people getting into this. So, uh, <laughs> and you're an award winner. I, I think I read somewhere as well. Yeah. So uh-huh. you're very detailed in uh, your gifts. And so, uh, tell us more about ventriloquism. What was it that drew you to this sort of uh, entertainment? Um, I think that it, the the great thing about puppets. Um, is that when you put a puppet on your hand, you can say just about anything. It's not, you know, and people will attribute it to the puppet and not to you. And as a child, I found that just incredibly appealing. And and would talk to my puppets and they would share things with my puppets um, that they might not be willing to share with um, with anybody else. Right. And so eventually I became a puppet therapist at Boston Children's Hospital using puppets to help kids uh, talk about their feelings and gain some kind of sense of control over what was happening in their lives. It's a fantastic medium. Absolutely. And you said you used it on with Fred Rogers. So you found him as after he had already started his show. How did that relationship build? Um, when I was 19, I, I saw his show and I realized that he was doing exactly what I wanted to do. He was using really sound uh, principles of child development um, to, uh, to create um, stories that would be helpful to children in coping with their lives. So I wrote him a letter and um, I went down to meet him. And um, about a year and a half later, um, he invited me to be on his show. So I went down and ended up taping a couple of shows. And I, I did that periodically over the course of several years. And then I started making videotapes about difficult issues. Yeah. Um, for kids with his production team. So we did, a, for instance, a whole series on racism called Different and the Same, helping children identify and prevent prejudice. That is an awful lot you're doing behind the scenes. This is stuff I didn't have in my notes that I'm not necessarily prepared <laughs> for, but I'm so excited because you have really dived deep into this idea of creating good content for our children. And for, mm-hmm. for me, Susan, I have two kids. Uh, one is almost three and the other one's almost two. And so we've got these two young ones at home. I'm a new father and I'm trying to figure out, you know, how can I become a person who brings something to them worth watching? For me, I had Mr. Rogers and you knew the value of Mr. Rogers. And today's world, we aren't getting a lot of those Mr. Rogers. He's gone and now we're he's having a bit of a resurgence right now. You know, he's got the documentary right. going on. People are, you know, turning their eye back to what he was doing. And I think that's great because he did a lot of great things. And so for you, what was it about his show in particular that really drew you and, you know, made it a valuable show? Because um, it was totally um, and completely for children and, and to promote children's well-being. I'm, and so a lot of, Children's shows feel obligated to include things for adults Mm -hmm. to keep the parents watching as well. And he didn't do that. I mean, everything in that show was incredibly um, carefully thought out. And, um, and, um, and, And based on what preschool children, young children really need. It was an extraordinary show. I mean... It's funny because it was kind of, you know, sort of cased in a 1950s sort of ambiance. Yeah. But in fact, it was probably the most radical children's television program that's ever been on. I mean, he dealt with things like war and peace and hunger and greed. Yeah. Um, oil. I mean, he, he was just, he just did extraordinary things. One of my favorite shows of his um, was the one where, about Santa Claus. And he did this show about Santa Claus. And by the end of it, if kids were ready to stop believing in Santa Claus, 
um, they could do that. And if they weren't ready, they would still believe in Santa Claus. Oh it was goodness. really <laughs> brilliant. And also he said, you know, um, there are children who don't have Santa Claus. He said they are, wow. they're children who don't even know who Santa Claus is. But everybody in the world believes in giving and receiving. And those are two uh, core, core values that we like to talk about on, on the show. Our Christian-based show talks about the values of the Bible. Now, Mr. Rogers has professed his faith. I've, I've looked at his book, you know, The Simple Faith of Mr. Rogers. But he didn't really introduce this into his programming. Yet he was still able to take the morals of the Bible and, and translate it into just loving each other and trying to educate one another. Mm -hmm. So I, I think he didn't, he didn't believe that he needed to impose his faith on other people. Right. And, so and he took, he took, you're right. He took, he took the morals and the values. And so for us today, if you're looking back at like, like you said, he, he talks about all the topics of that day, whether it was oil or war and these types of things. Mm -hmm. now, now we've still got topics like that today, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure it can. Is it is it politically correct? Is that even the right term to to you know? Could we put Mr. Rogers on the air today and would it be successful? Um, I think not. Um, mostly because most of the programming for children today is supported through either commercials or through brand licensing, selling toys. So it's hard to find anything on television that isn't selling kids something. And he didn't do that. On the phone with us tonight, Dr. Susan Lynn. She is the author of The Case for Make-Believe, Saving Play in a Commercial World. She's also written Consuming Kids, The Hostile Takeover of Childhood. You can find those books in bookstores. Now you can visit her over at SusanLynn.net. I want to talk about this documentary that I saw you on that brought you to my attention and your valuable work that you're doing, you know, bringing education to us adults about our kids and what they're watching and why it's being shown to them. And so on this documentary that was also featuring Mr. Rogers, it's called Mr. Rogers and Me. You were interviewed in this and you were talking about programming, specifically the programming was aimed at children. You were just sort of touching on the idea that it's marketing. The shows are created to market our children, whether it's cereal or toys or whatever it is. And a couple things you said, and this really jumped off of the movie, even though I was watching it to sort of learn more about Mr. Rogers, I was really taken aback by some of the things that you personally brought up on the movie. And you said in the, in the movie, you said that 19% of babies under one have a TV in their bedroom in the United States. And then you go on to say that 40% of three month old babies are regular viewers of TV. These numbers I mean, they blew me away, Susan, and even I started to look up. I went on the Internet to Google search these numbers, and I even found a more alarming number today, and I don't know if you'll agree with this or not, that it says before children reaches kindergarten, they will have, on average, watched 4,000 hours of screen bef between TV and phone and their tablets. Right. It's um, Yeah, things are actually um, worse than they were when that film was made, which was only a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the escalation of, of screens in the lives of children is, is young children is really troubling. I, I mean, especially, you know, the push to get babies in front of screens and there's no evidence that any kind of screen time is beneficial for babies. And there's some evidence, you know, growing evidence that it may be harmful. Really? So they've done studies to figure, you know, putting the TV in your, like for me, I have a, I have a, a two-year-old and three-year-old. There's no way I would put a TV in their room. It's, it's, already, right. there's already a TV they watch too much anyway. We'll get into that in a moment. But, you know, yeah. is, is, is a, a three-month-old, I can't imagine who's turning the channel for them. They can't turn it on for themselves. No, no, I think that, um, that for one thing, parents are being sold a bill of goods by these media companies and the tech companies that it's educational. Hmm. Um, and when for babies, for children under two, it certainly isn't. And, um, and, and there's this push that parents believe that if they don't um, – that their kids need to have experiences with tablets, for instance, or mm -hmm. touch screens as soon as possible so that they'll be able to compete in the world. Wow. But 
but so you so you have that all these babies on iPads and um, you know the the iPotty, which is a potty you know where you can put an iPad. Oh man! <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean a, a, an activity seat that has a screen for a baby that's really blocking the baby's view of of the world, which is what the baby um, really needs. So, um, so, but, but the irony is that when Steve Jobs was asked what his children thought of the iPad, he said they've never seen one. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> so, you know, it, so I guess it was okay for everybody else's children, right. but not his. Susan, you had mentioned some of these numbers already. We've been talking about them. You said it's sort of gotten worse. Do you have any numbers off the top of your head that sort of, the data that highlights the uses of screens by our children? Um, what, let me, what's gotten worse is that um, the screens are more portable. Mm. So it's not like, you know, like the stats about children watching television, that's the television stayed in the house. But now with tablets and phones, the kids can take them anywhere. And that's really troubling. Yeah, for my family, and I know that, you know, I didn't, I, I honestly, Susan, and we'll talk about this in, in just a little bit too. I didn't realize I was adding to the problem. I thought I was just an average parent who was letting their children use the phone to play a game or, you know, watching TV just to get some free time for myself as a parent. But when I heard these numbers, especially about the 4,000 hours, that is an awful lot of time for my child to be influenced by someone who's not me or not, you know, my wife. Right. And so, and I'm not as yeah, intentional. It's funny, you yeah. know, people, um, like you wouldn't let a stranger in your house and right. spend 4,000 hours with your child, but because it's television or it's, you know, on the iPad or, you know, the, the phone, then it, it's fine. I mean, that's, that's really bizarre in a way, if you think about it. You mentioned in the documentary, and I'm sure you've mentioned in other places as well, that there are two activities that you know are educational for our children. That's creative play and interacting with parents. Can you tell mm -hmm. us more about these two things? Yeah, creative play, hands-on creative play is the foundation of learning, creativity, constructive problem solving, um, the capacity to wrestle with life, to make it meaningful. It's how, it's how children naturally learn and explore the world. And, and that's really what we need. I mean, it's not that, you know, we have a digital divide so much anymore because now every, you know, low-income families have cell phones now. But what we're getting is a play divide where, um, you know, the low-income families are getting the message that screens are educational, and, and so the kids are, you know, watching more and more screens or playing games or things mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on screens instead of doing the things that they really need to do, which are exploring the world with all of their senses. And I think that, I think that in this country... We give up a lot for convenience, and um, it's easy. I mean, being a parent is really hard. Yes. It, it's, it's hard to do. And, you know, if you're lucky, you have a partner in your parenting. But, you know, there are a lot of single-parent families and parents who are working serial jobs. It's stressful. But, but I think what parents don't realize is that once you start putting kids in front of screens is that the children never learn to amuse and soothe themselves. Wow. So the kids that I know who, who have grown up screen free or pretty much screen free, they can go off and play by themselves for hours. Mm -hmm. But, but if you start kids, from the beginning of their lives, needing a screen in order to be stimulated, then they're just going to be dependent on those screens. 
And now there's growing concern about addiction. Um, and, and we all know that these devices are addiction. We're all addicted to them. Sure. I noticed that when I started being aware of what I was doing as a parent in letting my children have the screens in front of them, and when I took it away, there was this you know period where they'd get frustrated and angry. It's sort of like a you know a withdrawal of some sort. Mm -hmm. and, 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 but then once they you know knew that it wasn't coming back on, the toys became more exciting, and then they wanted to find something else to do. So I know that they're, they have the ability to play, but I don't want them to get to a point where they can't figure out what the next thing to do in life is. So um, Right. You know, I, and one of the things um, that, that I think we forget is the importance of boredom. Yeah. <laughs> the it's importance a, of boredom. Right. Because it, it's, if, if, you're, if you have a chance to be bored, then you find things to do. You make things up. I mean, if, when I, I watch kids a lot, like when I'm, I'm in a store or I'm walking around, and, and if kids don't have a screen, they play. I mean, if they're in a store, they'll, they'll jump around, you know, the lines on the floor, or they'll make up some kind of game, or they'll sing, or they'll do you know, weird things with their body, but, but they, they can um, amuse themselves and, and also they engage with the rest of the world. They look around and, and, um, and take an interest in the world. So while it's convenient when you're going out to dinner to give kids cell phones, so, so you and, you know, your partner can talk. Yeah. Um, but in doing that, you're training the kids not to be able to um, amuse themselves and take an interest in the world. Train our kids up to do the right things. Uh, we have to take a quick break, Susan, but we'll be back in just a couple minutes. More with Susan okay. Lynn when we come back on the new John Simmons show. Don't forget the case for Make Believe, Saving Play in a Commercialized World. Her book is available over in bookstores now, Amazon.com. And when we come back, we'll discuss what can we do differently to change our culture, to change our intentionality as parents. More with Dr. Susan Lynn when we come back on the new John Simmons Show. In 2012, I found myself at the end of my rope for what seemed like the hundredth time. I cried out to God and said, God, if you're real, I need you to show me a future and a hope for my life. What happened next changed my life forever. It took me out of my life where I was a gambling addict who had lost over $500,000. allowed me to begin a new life in Christ where I found more joy, peace, and hope than I ever knew existed. I share the stories, including where I blame God for my father's death and the call into ministry that I found in my first book called Finding Faith. I also share with you the answers to the questions that I was asking God about what is faith and how can I move mountains with it. Finding Faith has those stories and so much more. I absolutely believe it can encourage you to find faith in your life today. Finding Faith by me, the new John Simmons, is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble website, Walmart. You can also pick up a copy signed by me over at newjohnsimmons.com. Testimony House Ministries is the proud sponsor of the new John Simmons Show. We are so thankful for all of you who tune into the show, watch us live on Facebook or on our YouTube channel. Without all of you, the new John Simmons show and all the other Testimony House Network shows would not be possible. Please visit newjohnsimmons.com today and click the Partner With Us tab to help us continue sharing our message of the future and a hope through Christ with others. God bless. Are you interested in learning more about finding God's sentence for your life? At newjohnsimmons.com, there are articles and videos describing how you can begin to write God's sentence for your life by finding passion, vision, and faith. In addition, NewJohnSimmons.com has a variety of ways for you to be encouraged to continue writing God's sentence. As always, you can hear the show live weekdays at 9 p.m. Central Time by clicking the Listen Live button when you visit NewJohnSimmons.com. One of my favorite testimonies of fitness and faith is the story of Heather McAdams. Heather found Jesus in 2013, and around the same time, she also found the determination to change her health both physically and spiritually. Years later, she has shed many pounds, but has also shed the weight of stress and sin when she became a new woman in Christ. 
Today, she wants to use what she's learned to help you meet your fitness and spiritual goals through her ministry called Faithfully Fit and Wellness. Heather hosts classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays that can help build your strength and also your spirit through exercise, prayer, and fellowship. Call her today and tell her you heard her story on the new John Simmons show, and she will meet with you for a free 30-minute wellness session, where she'll sit down and discuss your faith and fitness walk, and also help you write some goals for your spiritual and fitness future. This is your chance to write your testimony of faith and fitness. Visit Heather's website at faithfully.fit, find her on social media at Faithfully Fit Wellness, or call her today at 314-239-4149. That's Faithfully Fit. Get where you want to be physically, mentally, and spiritually. WGNU, the talk of St. Louis. Broadcasting on 920 AM and 106.9 FM. We're back on the new John Simmons Show, part of the Testimony House Network, weeknights at 9 p.m. Central Standard Time, also on your radio, on your home devices, and also on your podcast store. That's right. We're available on iTunes, Google Play, CastBox, and TuneIn. So all of these things available for you to be able to share this show with others. Our guest tonight is Dr. Susan Lynn. She is the author of The Case for Make-Believe, Saving Play in a Commercialized World. She was also the founding director of the Commercial Free Childhood, And uh, we're here talking about how she was a ventriloquist on Mr. Rogers and how now she has written extensively about the effects of media and commercial marketing on children. Susan, we're back. And I wanted to ask you, because you had mentioned in the last segment, you had said that there were homes of children that you had seen that had absolutely no engagement with the screens. That fascinates me. I didn't realize that was even possible in today's world. Can you tell us more about that? Well, you know, I, I mean, their parents have phones. Yeah. So it's not like they don't see screens. Okay. They see screens in restaurants and they see screens at their friends' houses. But I I do know parents who are uh, who are raising their kids as screen free as they possibly can, and um, and the kids that I know who who have minimal screens or who are pretty much screen free. Are, for one thing, they're able to entertain themselves. Yeah. They read, they play, they make things. So they, they don't need constant stimulation. And one of the things that Fred Rogers talked about and he talked to me about was silence and the importance of silence. And kids need silence because that's how they can listen to what's going on in their minds and in their imagination. Do you think, I mean, we're just bombarded mm -hmm. with noise. Do you think that shutting off the screen time and allowing our kids to have silence, is that, is that the answer to some of the problems that we're having today in all the screen hours, or is it just maybe one solution? Um, well, if, if one of the problems is that, kids are watching too many or spending too much time with screens, then it seems like turning them off is yeah. the only solution, <laughs> right? I right. mean, what else could you do? I'm not exactly sure. I'm just trying to get, yeah. you, know, you know, to our listeners out there, if they're a parent like me, and maybe this is the first time they've realized that they're, you know, maybe not being intentional right. with what they're showing their children. Right. And, and, we're saying just shut the screens off. Maybe there's another thing we can do because in their minds, like you said, some of us think that what the kids are watching are educational already. What, how, mm -hmm. do, how do we combat this and, and you know, inform our parents that what the shows that our kids are watching, most of them are not educational? Yeah, and it depends. And even the ones that might be educational also come with a whole lot of marketing. So then you've got the problems of the kids wanting the toys. So if the and, and and companies encouraging kids to nag for toys, I know all about this. I you know we I've fallen into this trap already, Susan. I want to become a better parent. I don't want to you know let my child watch you know the Moana movie a hundred times in fifty days and then buy her all the toys. I want to be a parent who's engaged with my child, who's training them and educating them. And so, what is it that I can do as a parent to? you know, help me in my battle to stay away from the screens and still be more engaged when I would say some parents would say, well, this is my free time or this is my quiet time when the child's in front of the screen. Mm -hmm. Right. So 
I mean, one thing is take a look at, at the screen use in your house. Take a look at whether it's, it's alleviating stress or causing stress. Are the kids, you know, cranky and irritable when you try to turn it off, for mm-hmm. instance, or do you have to argue with them to get them to come to dinner? Yeah, I've seen that. And, and if you feel that it's just too overwhelming, you know, to, to, or impossible, you feel, to turn off the screens, then look at where you can cut back. Right. I mean, designate screen-free times in your day or in your, in your week with the kids. Screen-free meals are really important. I mean, that's the one thing that, it, that, that you know, parents can do is sit down with kids at meals and have conversations with them. I Talk want, to them yeah, so I, they, they get, you know, that's where family stories get passed on is the dinner table. That's an excellent point because I love telling stories. Our ministry is called Testimony House. Our desire is to tell a story of how we found Jesus. But for our children, you know, that faith conversation is not something we can have with them yet, but we can tell the story about what we did when we were their age or what we did at school. Mm -hmm. And this is more engaging to them than, you know, just them watching TV while we all eat together. Right. And 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 so I think um, some families, you know, designate a screen free night where everybody plays games together or you draw, or you sing, or you do whatever you'd like to do as a family. So I, I think, I mean, I know that, um, you know, we've gotten very dependent on our screens, and especially, you know, if your kids have been having a lot of screen time, it's initially going to be difficult to cut back. But I think what you said is really important, that it starts out with the kids being antsy about it and then eventually they think of other things to do what is it that in today's world we're not able to you know translate the mr rogers to today do you know or do you like if if you were going to advocate for any program or maybe you, you would say just don't watch any of them is there a program out there today or programs plural that are aimed at our children and are educational in a way that's not just a, sh- uh, a show they watch at school I mean, I, you know, I think that, um, I mean, I think that PBS has some really good programming Mm -hmm. and it's free. It's not, you know, it's not cable. Right. Um, And I think that the, the, the problem isn't, I mean, there, there are, I think there are, are plenty of, of shows or enough shows that have good content for kids. That, but the problem is that there's, it, there's just too much screen time. Dr. Susan Lins joined us on the program tonight. She's written a book called The Case for Make Believe, Saving Play in a Commercialized World. We've also talked a little bit about what she wrote about in Consuming Kids, the hostile takeover of childhood. This is the idea that our shows are being marketed to our children to have them have them nag their parents for the next toy or the next box of cereal. I want to be able to be an intentional parent, and I want to be able to encourage you that our children might be spending too much time in front of the screens, and it might be having an impact uh, more negative than we would even think that it would have on them. And so I want to bring up this idea. For us as a, as a ministry, Susan, we're trying to create content. We have this radio show, and we have other things that we do to help other people. And we really want to dive into this world of producing content for children. And again, you know, we've already talked about that the faith conversation isn't always one you have with the children, but what is it that we could do maybe if we were, you know, thinking in wide generalized ideas of things that we could, not necessarily specific segments, but, you know, what kind of concepts need to be in a show that can be uh, fruitful in a child's life today, like Mr. Rogers was? Um, I think that um, one of the things that's happening has been happening in media for a long time for kids is that they, um, it, it, it moves very quickly. It moves way too quickly. Mm-hmm. And that one of the things that, um, that, that the, the games on, on tablets and apps, there's a lot of, you know, poking with your finger or swiping or, you know, that kind of thing. But I think what kids really need is narrative. 
They need stories. And, and um, as you know, um, stories are, are a great way for helping children talk about feelings or, or, to, or gain empathy for somebody else. So, and, and, and I, so I think that, um, I think that, that kids need stories. And that's something we like to do on this show, and it definitely translates to the future of what we're trying to accomplish. How can we tell the stories, not just of the Bible, but of the people who are trying to increase in love on one another, increase in the world, and, and leave a lasting impact positively? Dr. Susan Lynn has been with us on the program. Uh, Susan, do you have any way that people can contact you or reach out to you, or is there anything uh, you're doing right now that you'd like to talk about, how they can find you? Well, I think that um, I think that what would be really helpful to people is for them to get in touch with the campaign for commercial free childhood. Mm -hmm. It's um, the website is commercialfreechildhood.org. In addition to being an activist group, taking on these huge corporations who are um, undermining children's lives with all of this commercialism, they also have tips for parents about um, parent tested Screen free ideas, and they they have Screen Free Week um, every year, which is something you can celebrate. I think that taking a look at that website would be really beneficial. Yeah, especially for someone if you're like me and this is the first time you're hearing about it, like I was just a few months ago when I when I saw this documentary and I reached out to find Susan because she has a ton of information, and this is where she came from, the commercial free childhood. Correct, Susan? Mm-hmm. And so you have yes. a wonderful resource. Uh, I'll I'll, I'll leave the link in the next segment for everybody, and it'll be also on the Facebook Live link if you want to find that for yourself. Uh, But uh, Susan, is there any way particular they want to get your books? Um, The books are are available on Amazon. That's probably the best way to get them now. Well, I'm so thankful that you took the time with us tonight. I'm, I mean, it's truly, I'm, I'm grateful and honored that you've joined us on the program tonight. I've learned a lot. Uh, we're picking up your books and reading them, and we're going <laughs> to hopefully be able to be uh, wiser parents in the future. Thanks, Susan. Well, thank you. All right. We'll Bye-bye. see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, Dr. Susan Lynn, everyone, author of The Case for Make Believe, Saving Play in a Commercialized World. She joined us on the program tonight to talk about all that it is, screen time in our children, the average child before they are five years old, spends 4,000 hours in front of a screen. I love what she said. You wouldn't let a stranger spend that much time with your children. That's a sobering thought. You're right. I wouldn't let a a stranger spend two hours or one hour, you know. (laughs) And yet we invite all of these characters and their thoughts and their songs and their ideas into into our living room, into their eyes, into their minds, even when we're not watching, we don't know what they're saying. Have you ever left the room when your kid's watching TV? You have now, you know, lost your idea to know what that kid is learning and what they're hearing and what they are seeing. And for me, hearing Dr. Susan Lynn on the Mr. Rogers and Me documentary was such an eye-opening experience to understand that God's plan for my life is to be intentional in my parenting. And I want to be able to create children who are engaged in learning and being educated and that I actually have a part in that, and then I'm not just allowing the screens to do it for me. So a great conversation. I'm thankful for her for joining us on the program tonight. As she said, find her books, The Case for Make-Believe or Consuming Kids, over at Amazon.com. When we come back, uh, just a wrap-up conversation about uh, what the ministry is up to and uh, what you can expect for us over the summer. Don't go away. You're listening to The New John Simmons Show, part of the Testimony House Network. Hey everybody, new John Simmons here with you. Back in 2012, I found myself at the end of my rope for what seemed like the hundredth time. I cried out to God and said, God, if you're real, I need you to show me a future and a hope for my life. What happened next changed my life forever. It took me out of my life where I was a gambling addict who had lost over $500,000 and allowed me to begin a new life in Christ where I found more joy, peace, and hope than I ever knew existed. I share the stories, including where I blame God for my father's death and the call into ministry that I found in my first book called Finding Faith. I also share with you the answers to the questions that I was asking God about what is faith 
and how can I move mountains with it? Finding Faith has those stories and so much more. I absolutely believe it can encourage you to find faith in your life today. Finding Faith by me, the new John Simmons, is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble website, Walmart. You can also pick up a copy signed by me over at newjohnsimmons.com. Testimony House Ministries is the proud sponsor of the new John Simmons Show. We are so thankful for all of you who tune into the show, watch us live on Facebook or on our YouTube channel. Without all of you, the new John Simmons Show and all the other Testimony House Network shows would not be possible. Please visit newjohnsimmons.com today and click the Partner With Us tab to help us continue sharing our message of future and a hope through Christ with others. God bless. Are you interested in learning more about finding God's sentence for your life? At newjohnsimmons.com, there are articles and videos describing how you can begin to write God's sentence for your life by finding passion, vision, and faith. In addition, newjohnsimmons.com has a variety of ways for you to be encouraged to continue writing God's sentence. As always, you can hear the show live weekdays at 9 p.m. Central Time by clicking the Listen Live button when you visit newjohnsimmons.com. One of my favorite testimonies of fitness and faith is the story of Heather McAdams. Heather found Jesus in 2013, and around the same time, she also found the determination to change her health both physically and spiritually. Years later, she has shed many pounds, but has also shed the weight of stress and sin when she became a new woman in Christ. Today, she wants to use what she's learned to help you meet your fitness and spiritual goals through her ministry called Faithfully Fit and Wellness. Heather hosts classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays that can help build your strength and also your spirit through exercise, prayer, and fellowship. Call her today and tell her you heard her story on the new John Simmons Show, and she will meet with you for a free 30-minute wellness session, where she'll sit down and discuss your faith and fitness walk, and also help you write some goals for your spiritual and fitness future. This is your chance to write your testimony of faith and fitness. Visit Heather's website at faithfully.fit. Find her on social media at faithfullyfitwear today at 314-239-4149. That's Faithfully Fit. Get where you want to be physically, mentally, and spiritually. Every topic is on the table here at WGNU 920 AM and 106.9 FM. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. It's the new John Simmons Show. So excited you've joined us on tonight's program. Man, that's a great conversation with Dr. Susan Lynn earlier. Uh, commercialfreechildhood.org is the website that she shared before we left the air. It has a number of articles and videos and ways that you can become a more engaged parent, how you can get involved in their efforts to be part of the changes that are being made in schools and in organizations that, you know, at, at the high school that I went to, I, I went back a year or so ago to speak uh, to some of the kids in the radio program over there. And every single one of them had an iPad that was given to them for school. And then they also had access, every single one of them, to an iMac laptop. I mean, the thought of having a computer given to me as a student is just so far beyond my understanding as as, as a person. I can't get it. And these kids, are they don't even, you can see them. They don't respect the fact that they all have a Mac book in front of them. They don't understand that they have these completely monstrous 27-inch iMacs at their workstations, and they get to use these miraculous tools that have been invented uh, for their schoolwork, and they get to take them home with them. And this idea for me that the screens talk about too much screen time, if they're given to them and they get to take them home, that's they're they're advocating that even the schools that the children have screens in front of them one of the articles that i've recently read over at commercialfreechildhood.org i meant to talk about this on the show a few weeks ago but it was reminded as i pull up the website just now to share with you guys the link is in the facebook description is this article called experts and advocates caution parents to steer clear of new amazon echo dot for kids echo dot is a device that it's a home device. You can use it to play podcasts and music or, you know, work as a remote for your TV. We have two of these in my home currently, not the ones for the kids, but the adult ones, I guess. So we use it to play songs and listen to podcasts. You can even hear my show on it. If you say the words the correct way, (laughs) 
And now they've come out with this new product for the kids where it's, you know, voice recognition is different. It's kids programming and apps that are installed on it. And Amazon is touting this as a way for, you know, children to be educated and to fight boredom and all of these things. And it wasn't just Dr. Susan Lynn talking about how we need to encourage boredom in our children because it, it creates the atmosphere of them trying to find what to do with their own time and how they're going to keep themselves occupied, how they're going to soothe themselves and not be relying upon a device and these sorts of things. When realizing that Amazon has created this thing for the kids, not to, you know, make them a better kid or to really give them something that's going to help them become smarter and educate them. It's really done so that Amazon has them from the time they're a child to the time that they're older, that they're using their products, that all the things in the room are associated with a Kindle or an Amazon. It's all trying to move you into this purchase funnel where I'm sure the Amazon for kids app lets you buy certain apps or lets you buy certain children's songs and things like this where or games that are not necessarily wrong and evil in and of themselves, but if I'm trying to be an aware parent who's being intentional about my, what my kids watch and listen and put into their minds, this Echo Dot thing, I, you know, for us, I like the fact that my kid can't turn on whatever song she wants or whatever, you know, movie she wants to watch yet. But she can. If she gets a hold of a screen, she knows how to navigate YouTube sometimes better than I do, my, my oldest daughter. That to me is scary. <laughs> Imagine when she's five or ten, or maybe you guys have children that age. How they're better at the computer than you are. Well, what are they watching when we're not in the room? Do we have any say in what they're watching? Do we care? And if we do care, you know, we're being intentional enough to say, well, okay, you can watch your show for an hour, but you have to watch this other show that's better for an hour. Or you, you know, you get just the one day a week of screen time. Are we making choices like that? Or are we just saying, you know, do what you want, whenever you want. That's how I was until I came across this information. It was eye-opening to me. I'll be clear. I was using the TV as a babysitter for a minute. Uh, whatever that makes me feel like to you, I'm sorry. <laughs> but the truth is I had read the books. I'd read a, two books on parenting children uh, from a Christian perspective that talked specifically about technology. And they had said these types of things that Susan went on to talk about. But I wasn't convinced that at the age my children are, one years old and two years old, that the screens would really have that much of an impact. You know, they can't form memories. They're not forming many memories, I should say. They're not able to, you know, talk about what they just saw five minutes later. But it seems that there is a lot more to it than that. This idea that, I don't want my child having spent, you know, years of their life, essentially, by the time they turn five years old in front of a screen and me not be able to tell you what the name of any of the shows were that she watched or he watched. Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's a good show. I would, you know, be the first one to sort of ignore what she was talking to me about or what song she was singing. It's super cute, but daddy's watching something else over here. Daddy's cooking dinner or whatever it was. I want to be a more intentional parent. I'm very thankful that I was able to find Susan Lynn and her organization, Child Free. I'm sorry, commercialfreechildhood.org. Moving on, though, a few minutes left in tonight's broadcast, I wanted to discuss our ministry testimony house and our summer plans. That's right. Behind the scenes, and you've heard us on the show talk in great detail about how we're trying to build a radio network and a video network and trying to produce great content for you as our viewers and also uh, for your friends and your coworkers and people who want to be encouraged in Christ. We are taking some time to reevaluate how we're putting the projects together and involve some more people in that process and hopefully be able to put together some really neat and exciting things moving forward. With that being said, uh, we're taking a brief hiatus, brief hiatus from doing the live radio show. Uh, we'll be still airing best of shows uh, for parts of the summer, and then hopefully we'll reevaluate in this meantime and work with our ministry to be able to create new content for you moving forward, whether it's 
a couple weeks from now, a month from now, or two months from now. Our goal is to be able to educate, edify, and entertain via content and really press into God's will for our ministry. That's really our, our goal here. Our goal is to be able to serve you and to really be able to show our love for you and to be able to guide you to know who Christ is and how much he loves you. And we want to be able to do that in a way that is beneficial to God's kingdom. And so whatever God's plan is for our ministry, we want to make sure that we're following it. So we're taking some time to really press into the Lord and really find his will in all of this. We want to be able to make sure that we're on the right path and the programs that we're going to create in the future or not create or the ideas that we have from a ministry standpoint are going to be those that are suited best to showing God's love to you. That's our goal and that always has been our goal. Whether we've accomplished it well or not is another story. So we're going to continue to be on the air here and in our other markets and we're still going to continue to be available to you via uh, the live stream. You can comment us, you can find us on the podcast, you can message us on Facebook. All of these things are going to be available to you still. You'll still be able to message us through the ministry page. You're still going to be able to find shows on newjohnsimmons.com. You still might find a couple live streams in the meantime. You might find some videos and some podcasts sporadically put up if something comes to mind or if we're, we're struck to action. But our goal here is really to take a step back so that we can take a real big step forward. We want to be able to really share the gospel in an impactful way, and we want to make sure that God's using us in the way that he's built us and designed us to do. My gifts and talents are no different than your gifts and talents. If they're not being utilized in the way that God intended, they won't produce as much fruit. You know, you talk about pruning a vine or pruning the branches of a tree that's bearing fruit. Sometimes you have to get pruned in order to bear more fruit. Sometimes you got to cut off an old branch so that two more can sprout in its place. And for us, that's sort of what we're doing. We're trying to prune what's not needed, and we're trying to take reflection and take a step back so that we can see the whole picture. And instead of just looking at one area of the painting, you can see the whole thing. So we just wanted to share with you guys, our listening audience, whether you're catching the show on a podcast or you're watching the Facebook replay or you're watching live right now or listening in your car radio, that our plan is to share the gospel. Our plan is to share that God has a sentence and a plan for your life. God's given you the unique gifts and plans and the calling that he has for your life. If you just find passion, vision, and faith to walk it out, you're going to be able to step into this awesome authority of God's power that he's blessed through the Holy Spirit in your life and that you can use to share the love of God with others and share the salvation of Christ with others. And you're going to be able to help your family, your friends, but more importantly, you're going to be able to serve the world with what God's already given you. These things are so important to the walk of a Christian. We can't just sit back and think that, well, I got born again when I was 12 and that's enough. We have to realize that God wants more out of us. God, who loves us tremendously, died on the cross for us. He bestowed us with these irrevocable gifts, and he's given us the treasure of faith that we can use to see our future transform. And when we use our faith, the Bible says that our lives going to overflow in Romans 15, 13 with joy, peace, and hope. And this is truly what the Word of God is. It's hope-filled. Reading the Word of God can fill you with hope. Finding Christ in your life can restore the brokenness and the damage that's in your heart, the frustration, the anger, the unforgiveness, the desire that you have to sit on the couch and not do anything with your life. It can remove these things. It can give you a calling on your life that is truly remarkable because the, the Son of God that died on the cross for you is remarkable and what he's put inside you is just as much. Not because you've earned it, not because you deserve it, not because you're entitled to it, but because God loves you and he gave us all of these gifts so that more and more can find him who is worthy, who is entitled to praise and worship, the Lord in heaven, Jesus Christ. I want to encourage all of you, if you don't know God right now, Jesus is who he sent to die on the cross for your sins. The payment of sin is death. The Bible says this, and only through Jesus can you find salvation. This is the only method, the only way by which you can be saved is the name of Jesus Romans 10, 9 says it this way. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. Ephesians 2, 10 goes on to say that you were created by God. You are his handiwork, his masterpiece. And you were designed by God to do good works through Christ Jesus. So after you find Christ Jesus, know that you've been given gifts. You are the masterpiece creation of God. 
to do good things. And we say that the good things that God wants us to do are to love God with all our heart, mind, and strength, and also to love others as ourself. These are the two commandments that Jesus talked about in the Gospels that all of the other commandments hang off of. And now that we have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us after we become born again, it also says in Romans that the law is now written on our hearts. So our conscience is now what guides our behavior and our thoughts because the Holy Spirit is now involved in our thought process and brings conviction to us when we're doing things wrong. And so when we become born again, our goal is to find Jesus in our heart and then to seek out a relationship with God through quality time and communication. And then when you start to do that, you're going to find a passion for God. And after you discover your passion for God, I want you to do this. I want you to pray and ask God for spiritual wisdom and insight. This is what finding vision is. The ability to see your future and not look back at your past and say, why am I in all this trouble? Why did all these bad things happen to me? But yet, look at the future that God died on the cross for you for. And you go after there and chase it. And when you find a vision from God, when you pray and you ask God for spiritual wisdom and insight, and he says, I want you to go here, I want you to do this, I want you to be part of this, you're going to have to step and take big steps of faith in your life. And the faith, according to Hebrews 11, is the ability to have hope in the things, hope and confidence in the unknown things of the future, assurance in things unseen. This is the idea that you're able to look forward with your life and know that where you're going, even though it may be unlikely in your past life, you would have thought it was unlikely, or maybe you feel like you're not worthy enough or you're not good enough or you're not smart enough. Good. It's not you that's going to do it. It's Christ inside you that's going to allow you to fulfill that. But you have to put faith, not in yourself, but in the Christ who died for you and was rose again as payment for your sins. I want to thank everybody for listening tonight. We'll see you again soon. I hope, and until then, I want to thank Mr. Curtis behind the boards. Thanks, everybody who's been on Facebook Live tonight. We'll catch you all again down the road. Don't forget, though, we pray that you discover a future and a hope for your life today. Thanks for listening to the new John Simmons Show, part of the Testimony House Network. To replay this episode or listen to past episodes, look for the new John Simmons Show podcast on your mobile device. Stay connected to the show. Read the latest news, blog posts, and see behind-the-scenes photos by following at New John Simmons on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you would like to learn more about how you can begin to write God's sentence for your life, or join a growing community of people who are finding passion, vision, and faith for their lives, please visit NewJohnSimmons.com. Until next time, we pray you discover a future and a hope for your life today.